was wonderful. And so now we get a chance to walk through our own, uh, our own challenge with, um, and maybe have a little bit of fun with it. So what we have up here is, and this time we all get to participate. So <laughs> what we have, what we do here is we try to make sure that we put as little as possible in the landfill. So um, what I'd like for you to do is tell me what you would like to do with this. So um, we have, so does anybody have any idea where we put this one? I actually, I actually don't. It's plastic bags, okay. So that would go, in the trash. Okay. Oh, where's our high V sack? Okay. So, okay, so plastic bags go to high V. Um, we can't send them to the regular recycling. So we've got some more things. Same thing here. Okay, good. And um, so I'll just make a little sack for them here. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let's see. How about something easy? Grapes. Dead grapes. <laughs> and a bun. So how about those? Yardy, right. Compost. So this is compost. Either to the yardy or to compost. And the reason we do that is, number one, to keep it out of the landfill and to put it back in the soil. Because this is made out of carbon because it's living things so just any living thing is there okay so we have another thing here and this one i always look we always look for the symbol and i guess this would also be a plastic bag yeah so we'll just put that in here with the high v stuff i've got a couple of things here uh some newspaper Okay, newspaper, recycling. What about this shiny one? Also, it can go in recycling. Good. In, in the old days, we didn't put that, but that goes in recycling. Okay, and how about this? Recycling. Yay. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, dryer lint. So, <laughs> isn't that exciting? <laughs> okay, it can go in the compost. It can go in the yardy. Right, and uh, so we'll just put it in there. Um, okay, what about this bottle? Recycle. Okay, great. Um, and a cup. Okay, so yeah, this has a number on it, and it has six, I think. So this can all go in recycle. Good, uh, we need a bigger recycler. And then this. Uh, yeah, yeah, so number five. Yeah, so it's, it's plastic, you could put it in the kit. Okay, we'll keep it, we won't put it in there, yeah. Okay, so anyway, so we'll put that in the kitchen, put that over here. And then uh, I've got another cute little thing. And this came, this has got a number six on it also. So recycle. And then milk cartons. Recycle. Okay. Like I said, we're going to be, <laughs> have a lot of recycling here. Okay. And then these little guys. Yay! You win. That is great. If corn yeah, if they're cornstarch. Right. So, and styrofoam lives forever. So, we know styrofoam, uh, you cannot, and, and so this is, this would work in there or anything. And then here we have the final, a light bulb. Out to the toxic waste of, right. Yeah, yes. 
Home Depot will cycle them. Lowe's. Okay. Yeah. Batteries plus. Okay, good. And they will also take batteries there at the battery place. So if you have used batteries or anything like that, they will take it there and they will recycle them. So that's really kind of good to know. Yeah. Um, it, what they do is, as far as I know, can you be, do you know a little more? They're just the different types of, of things, materials that are in them. Um, yeah. The number does indicate the type of plastic, but also depending on how complicated it is to recycle it. So the higher the number, the more the process, and not all communities can handle or, you know, some of the larger numbers. Uh, but I think we take up until five or something like that. Or, oh, seven, okay. Thank you. Okay, well, that was our little, our little game there. So now we're ready for this. Yes, question. What is Yardy? <laughs> Here. There. Okay, for the live streamers, uh, there's three different types of carts if you're within Cedar Rapids. The blue one is for recycling, and that's called Kirby, I think. <laughs> the uh, green one is uh, for compost and for uh, organic stuff, and that's called the Yardy, and the other one is Kirby, Kirby, Yardy, Kirby, Garby, Garby for <laughs> it's growing it Garbage, okay. Yep. So three different types of carts within Cedar Rapids. Okay. A couple okay, of years great. ago, Thank you. I had a whole garbage bag full of um, batteries and they charged me $15 to recycle them at the battery store. Yeah. So do it a little bit at a time. <laughs> As a member of the Earth Care team, I am, I am here to encourage all of us to be good stewards of planet Earth. And we all have all investigated what each of us can do in our daily lives. Today, I am focusing on plastic beverage bottles. I learned that America uses over 240 billion beverage bottles each year. Americans are now consuming more water than soda pop. Of course, that is good news in terms of healthful consumption. The bad news is that in Iowa there is not an incentive for recycling water bottles because there isn't a deposit. And the incentive of deposits has been shown to work. But first I want to back up and share some facts about making plastic water bottles. It takes 17 million plus barrels of oil to produce plastic for water bottles for one year in the United States and the equivalent amount of oil would fuel 1.3 million cars for a year. Now for some facts about what happens when we recycle plastic bottles. Bottles from Iowa are likely to end up in Riverside, California. For a plastic bottle, water, or soda to find its way from our hands to being reincarnated is a long process. When bottles arrive at the processing plant, the bottles are, un, are crushed and washed so that the labels fall off. Then it is ground into cornflake-sized pieces, sterilized, melted, and shaped into pellets. The recyclable project, product is called PET for petroleum. It is very important to recycle PET. PepsiCo purchases half of all PET. But there are not enough plastic bottles making it into the recycling system. Many plastic bottles become litter. In Iowa, most water bottles find their way into the landfill 
or litter the sidewalks and roadsides. We learned that it takes 450 to 1,000 years for plastic bottles to decompose in a landfill. Sadly, eight tons of plastic from the United States finds its way into the ocean every year. And 57% of that trash is water bottles. There is a dense amount of rubbish between Hawaii and California, twice the size of Texas. And in the Atlantic, there is another morass of waste as well, caught in the tidal currents. Debris in the ocean is a hazard to marine life. It is ingested by fish and eventually consumed by humans. In conclusion, do your part to recycle plastic litter by carrying your own to-go bottle. Do we have, so I'm mostly interested in soil. Um, is anybody here, uh, does anybody here have a farm? Any farmers in here? There's one? Okay, good. Um, so farmers are concerned about soil. Um, how about any, anybody garden? Any gardeners? Okay, a lot more, great. Okay, and so gardeners, you're concerned about soil also, right? Okay, and uh, how many people have a lawn? Okay, anybody have a lawn? Okay, if you don't have a lawn, how many people use a lawn uh, when they come to church? Okay, well, or whenever, you know. So, so the interesting thing is um, most of us have lawns. Um, we go to parks, we do all kinds of things. And, and if you'll notice your lawns, even if you take a walk, um, if that lawn is perfect, it has only blades of grass, nothing else, no dandelions, no weeds, nothing. What you're seeing there is an extremely unhealthy environment. The soil underneath is dead. And the problem with dead soil is it sequesters no carbon. How many people have heard of carbon sequestration? A few people. Okay, so carbon sequestration. What that means is that, uh, you know, basically we have allowed carbon to get loose and like carbon dioxide and go into the atmosphere. And so when we can see, when, what we want to do is we want to grab that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and bring it back because what the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere does is creates the greenhouse effect over our whole earth. So that means that sun comes in and heats up the earth. That is climate change. So because we have all the carbon, instead of having it in our biggest places, we have it in the soil, instead of having it, storing it in the soil and storing it in our plants and storing it in our bodies, we instead are allowing it to go up into the atmosphere and stay there because we have um, eliminated a lot of the possibility of the soil to, uh, to hold the carbon. So here we have um, the plants take in carbon dioxide. That's why we love plants. They take in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. So we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide, a symbiotic relationship. We need plants, plants need us, okay? Um, then to feed the plants, we have the microorganisms, um, and the microorganisms in the soil are the biggest uh, carbon source in the soil, and they're also the fertility of the soil. Uh, the things that are the fertility of the soil, that is the carbon in the soil. That's called fertile soil. Iowa used to have 10, uh, 12 uh, a foot, 12 inches of topsoil. 
that was fertile. And, um, and now we're down to six, a lot of places. Uh, we've either let it float away or we've also killed it. And then this kind of shows we have living soil that is created through actually um, organic practices and practices that are non-toxic. So, you know, anything that you put on your lawn is something that you actually should be able to eat. If you can't eat it, then you probably should not be putting it on your lawn because you are going to be breathing it. You're going to be taking it in every time you walk across that lawn or anybody's lawn. So, you know, we've got, you know, so many problems and they're all interconnected, you know, and it just, it makes a huge difference what we each do and what we each know in this. So as we put more organic, if we can just put more organic matter into the soil, then that will take it out of the atmosphere because there isn't an infinite amount. You know, as we hold it in the soil and we hold it um, other places, then it does all these things. Um, as we use more chemicals, more we have fertilizer overload and that kind of thing. Um, so uh, a lot of people have been talking about, about this. Um, Bandana Shiva is one. Maria Rodale is another. Um, I have put a, a book by R M Maria Rodale out there. I've put a way to keep from using toxic chemicals that kill the lawn and kill everybody. So I have several handouts out there um, that you can look at to see what things you can use. There are things that you can use besides Roundup. You know, you can use, vin well, excuse me, uh, glyophosphate, <laughs> glycophosphate, besides that. Um, you can use um, vinegar for one thing, and that will do the same thing. And you can eat vinegar, so it's healthy. So, yeah. Good for you. Thank you. That is great. So, anyway, and the other thing, another thing that you can do is you can make a garden. Because any time you make a garden, you're creating more healthy soil, you're creating more diverse, you're creating a more diverse environment, you're creating not a monoculture. Monocultures make very sick soil um, because it, you know, it's just one thing. And so it, it increases the disease and the environment you know, the environmental degradation, when you have just one thing. When you have a variety of plants, then you have a variety of microorganisms. Um, you put your, you know, your cuttings back in your soil, and, and it's actually easier to grow things. So, so anyway, um, and so I also have a thing with, <laughs> we, I did tell them to give me a, a time limit. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I also have something on uh, edible landscaping. So landscaping that you can do um, that will help the soil, help your garden, and look pretty. And you can do any kind of a garden. You know, it, you could put uh, instead of a part of your lawn. You know, um, you could even just put a few rose bushes in. You know, with something to cover the soil with a mulch or something like that. Um, you can put in um, a permaculture garden, which is a permanent agriculture, which doesn't need as much maintenance. So you can put a low maintenance in. So um, Jeff Lawton is uh, a, a, a famous scientist per permaculturist um, that's done a lot of work in the Middle East. And what he said in, he has a, uh, a YouTube on greening the desert where he was able to take a bit of desert by the, by the Dead Sea and through natural practices and through you know, natural design, able to bring that back into uh, a viable place to, uh, to live and to eat and to grow food, whether people were there or not. So, uh, but what Jeff Lawton says is that, um, all of the world's problems can be solved in a garden. 
food, you know, I mean, everything. Just think about that. Thanks. Okay, so the piece I chose to talk about is stormwater pollution and what are some of the things you could do at home uh, to reduce it. And when thinking about the stormwater problem, it's kind of important to consider the history of the landscape. And I have a few maps here that show the land cover in Iowa during uh, pre-settlement days, say around 1850, and what it looks like now. And on the left, you can see kind of the yellow represents prairies and grasslands, and the dark green represents forests. So then on the right, for uh, current day, the dark gray color represents row crops. And you can kind of compare the two and see that most of the prairie grasslands and forests have disappeared and you know there's a lot of row crops and urbanization and that impacts the way the water flows where you know natural conditions the soil acted like a sponge and you know moved water moved very slowly through the soil but then for modern conditions you have agricultural lands that are tiled and you also have urban uh, drainage so we kind of really have changed the hydrology very significantly and uh, so this slide kind of represents the, uh, for the, in the urban setting, what happens right now um, is that anything in your yard, fertilizers, motor oil, anything like that, after a rainstorm goes directly into storm sewers into streams and the rivers without any treatment. But you can do uh, what's called rainscaping in your yard and uh, have some techniques to kind of help the situation and kind of restore some of the original functions and here they would summarize it as slow it down, spread it out, and soak it in. So different strategies. One thing you consider is uh, putting in a rain barrel. It's a big uh, container. Uh, you know, you can either buy them or make them. And uh, so you put that in your downspout. You can intercept some of the rainwater and also help conserve uh, water, you know, say for a lawn or for your garden. Uh, so it's a way of kind of uh, you know, slowing the water down a little bit rather than sending into a storm sewer. And then a big thing you can do is a rain garden. And basically the way that works is you kind of create a little uh, ponding area. And when the water comes off your gutters, it gets, uh, you know, kind of trapped a little bit in the, uh, in the little cavity. And then you could put um, plantings that will so soak up that water. So you could definitely intercept a lot of... Uh, the rainwater before it heads, heads in the city storm sewer system. Um, and the benefits of rain gardens, they help uh, protect and restore natural hydrology. So kind of mimicking the original conditions and, uh, you know, intercept pollutants. And then biggies, you know, less lawn to mow, you know, less maintenance, chemicals, all that. And a very important uh, benefit also is to wildlife, especially birds and pollinators that you can put special plants that are native that, you know, goes after, you know, very particular species that you could support because, uh, you know, the standard lawn doesn't offer them anything, you know. So uh, one of the things that I'll, uh, I'll put some information at the Green Fair, but it's interesting to learn about native pollinators, like what plants to plant or little things you could do, like just leaving bare dirt, um, you know, will help them or leaving cavities or rot, rotting wood. Uh, one thing I learned is that when I, I used to cut down my garden and, uh, to the ground, but if you leave plant stalks, little bees will use that for, uh, you know, nesting. And sure enough, I did that, and you could see all the evidence that they've been pecking at that. And uh, so anyway, we'll have more information, some handouts of the Green Fair, and I, and I thank you. See if I'm turned on. Okay, I'm on. So now um, we've given you some some of what we a little bit of what we've researched. Um, but you, I know, have done things yourself that you can share with everybody else. So we invite you to share your own experiences um, with being Earth friendly. Um, just whatever you've done and, uh, you know, ideas that you're trying or that you have for all of us. So uh, here oh, we have, oh, okay. Oh. Here first. Uh, okay. Oh, okay, great. And Jim's going to be the runner, so. 
Do I have to stand or just? Uh, you can just talk okay. into the microphone. Um, so I have been choosing to eat less meat because our meat industry uses a lot of water and a lot of our resources. Um, we feed half of our food, our crops that we make to um, the animals that we eat. So I've chosen to kind of try and um, I've tried veganism and I was really bad at it. I really like mm -hmm. bacon and burgers. <laughs> so um, what yeah. I do is I just kind of try and substitute at least like one meal a week where I eat primarily greens. A lot more greens, a lot me less meat is um, my contribution that I try. So. Thank you. Excellent. All right, over to Joni. Yeah. And I am literally a runner here. Yeah. Okay. Now, this isn't something that I do, but my sister has taken the plastic gar um, grocery bags mm -hmm. and she macrames them into a purse. So she recycles them and then <laughs> she gives them away as presents. So then you have a purse forever. <laughs> yeah. That's you a do. good segue to Nina. <laughs> yeah. Did you have something else? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, why, why didn't I think of that? Thank you, Jim. Yes, hi. I own a company, Unities, that I started last November, and it's upcycled tees with upbeat messages, and it is used T-shirts, gently used T-shirts that are getting loved up again and getting back out there, keeping them out of the landfill and back on to us to find a, a happy home and make us feel good. So, Thank you. Yeah, it's That's wonderful. Okay. Currently, I'm putting uh, dryer lint outside because the birds are taking them for their nests. <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, at home, I, try, I have a compost pile, which is something you can also do, you know, not put in the yard. I don't know if people have heard of regenerative farming, but right. if you're interested in a way that agriculture can really um, do with carbon what you're talking about doing, looking on the internet about regenerative farming, which is supposed to be even better than organic farming. Right. And there is a book, um, The Soil Will Save Us, mm -hmm. that was written by a woman author whose name I don't recall. Elaine Ingram. Elaine Ingram. Yeah. Um, that yeah, I have not read yet, but I've heard is I've heard her interviewed, and it sounds mm -hmm. like it would be a wonderful book. Also, I have a question. We belong to a homeowners association, and we have a retention or detention pond behind us. Mm -hmm. And um, the people in our little section of the homeowners association like the golf course look mm -hmm. on their lawns. They want. No weeds, no dandelions, no, uh, no clover. And um, so I've tried to sell them on mm -hmm. the idea of going into something organic, but it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. We've had people come and talk with them from the city and from the uh, county extension. And uh, so we have a meeting this afternoon. <laughs> and I'm going to take pamphlets. Right. that are here, but also if anyone has any great selling points that I might be missing, I'm sure open to hearing what they might be. There, um, there is, uh, in, the, in the same people, the rainscaping people um, have a, there is a mixture for, for lawns that is um, a Midwest mixture of prairie, prairie grasses. So that is a much deeper um, root. So that would help a lot, and it would be more variety in the lawn, and you could still have your lawn look because it, it does seem like people have a real issue with that. Now, I'm afraid to even walk on... When I see, you know, that perfect lawn, I go, you know, I don't want to walk on it. I don't want my dog to walk on it. I don't want to touch it with my hands. Um, you know, it, it's really, uh, it, it is just really something that, you know, you need to watch, so. Oh, can I get a few points? Uh, also, there with the native grasses, you do not have to mow them that much at all. Buffalo grass, right. maybe a couple times a year. And the city also has cost-sharing <laughs> programs for um, soil quality restoration okay. and okay. native plantings, so that that might be a help. 
Okay, we're going to have to wrap up here. Um, so what we'd like now is are some ideas for what we can do here at Unity. We've given you a few clues, but no. Uh, so uh, what are some things that you think we could do? Last year for Earth Day, we came up. Yeah. Yes. At church um, every week, so they uh -huh. have like the screen right. filters, and then also recycling the coffee grounds into your plants right. um, will help them grow. Okay, thank you. Also, you. perk them up. Yes. Uh, <laughs> ah, ha, ha, ha. Ah, ha. Okay. Okay. What else? <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> Don't kill him, somebody. It's a spider. It's a spider. Yeah, we were, we're respecting... Don't squash them today. That's right, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, he was looking for somebody that was willing to carry him out, so... Uh, and the Earth Care team is a good place to find it, so yes. Okay. As many of you know, I crochet and I knit, and on Joni's idea, there have been many outreach... Um, things done at churches with recycling of uh, grocery bags by their cutting into what is called plarn. So you have a long string of the, of the bag and then they've made them into um, mats for homeless people to put underneath their blankets. I've seen sh permanent shopping bags for groceries because if you take them to the, mar the market, like mm -hmm. uh, the, the Hiawatha market is opening at, um, on the 30th, mm -hmm. so we can go to the farmer's market starting on the 30th. Oh, yeah. Um, you get them all full of dirt and crud and you take them out and hose them off and you've, mm -hmm. they're good as new. So I'm more than willing to assist anybody who would like to start a program of changing grocery bags into plarn into something. Yeah. So I will be that glad to assist good. that. Yeah. Why don't you give those to the people who use their food pantry? And ask right. Them to bring you can. Yeah. 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 Even even so, more than uh, recycling the plastic bags, I would like to see everyone not take plastic bags. That is the biggest thing because what we need is to have thank you. We need to have no demand for plastic bags. If we don't have demand for plastic bags, eventually they'll quit making them. You know, so anyway, just another another little and I do have them in my car I do have I do have non-plastic bags with me at all times <laughs> okay I think that's I'm going to yeah. give you one more and it suggests that you talk to people okay. about your feelings talk to your city council yeah talk to your state legislators there was I think there was a run at taking away the bottle deposit bill right this last legislative right session. yeah there are all kinds of and I know that with oil prices low there's not much demand for the recycling products and so those things right. all then begin to cost money and people look at those to do away with those type right. of programs that are very helpful so talk to people that yeah. count in making decisions about your feelings yeah it's, then and that's everybody not just the activists because we all have to participate we have to participate in our lives and you know our beliefs or they will be taken away <laughs> So if we don't stand up, then it, it will not happen. I have okay. one last comment. All right. Um, I went to the Eco Fair yesterday and saw a film DVD called Cowspiracy. Cowspiracy. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, you need to see it, and we may get it here at the church. But it opened my eyes phenomenally about, the, about animal uh, agriculture and that, in essence, the greenhouse gases um, 51% is produced by animal agriculture. Right. Amen. So, so that's corn, you know, growing corn and soybeans is a lot of it. So anyway, thank you very much. Um, and, oh, another, okay. <laughs> yeah. Right.
And um, I was really upset when I went to go on a run and all I could hear were trees getting knocked down. So I sent a very passionate letter. It wasn't like a mean letter, but I was just like, hey, this is really important to me. Why are we tearing this down? And I had a really great response by um, many members of the uh, people that I sent it to. I looked every email up that I could find online of people that work in the city, people like the governor, everybody. And um, yeah, they had really great feedback. And also right now they are doing that um, thousand acre uh, butterfly. butterfly. Yes. Yeah. And Habitat, Daniel Gibbons right. was the one yeah. that responded to me. So that was kind of cool to yeah. see that in action. Yeah. So there are some good things happening. And oh, the, the more, we, city more employees. we can plant, the more we can do. <laughs> the what? They said those darn city employees. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, and we are going to have um, a postcard writing campaign next weekend with the uh, Eco Fair. So maybe we can put some of those things down on paper and make a difference. <laughs>